another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors AMP, Laser Optech, and Equa Marketing. We also want to thank our silver sponsors Eilis Works and Pronops. If you would like to network and share your experience with our podcast guests and other aesthetic industry professionals, join our Facebook or LinkedIn communities by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Today we are going to be speaking with one of the finest experts in aesthetics. Our host, Jeffrey Richmond, is an award-winning 20-year veteran of the aesthetic industry whose passion led him to co-found the Business of Aesthetics community. Over to you, Jeff. Welcome to another edition of Business of Aesthetics. This is our, uh, I believe, 70th podcast, and we're, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to do it with Dr. Stephen Victor. Dr. Uh, Victor comes to us from New York. Dr. Victor, good evening. Hi there. How are you doing? Terrific. I, uh, I've been excited to speak with you because I know you have a ton of experience with regenerative medicine, specifically uh, being a dermatologist in the field of dermatology and, and aesthetics. And um, I think there's been a lot of kind of confusion around innovation. I think there's been a lot of talk of innovation for the last couple of years, but maybe we're not seeing all the products and things to market yet, but I, I was, um, I'm excited to speak with you and try to uncover some of that over the next 30 minutes or so. Okay, I'll do the best I can. Go ahead. Can you um, take a few minutes and share your, your practice is pretty unique because your area of specialization, I think is pretty unique, but can you um, just take a few minutes and explain how you got to you know the road that got you to where you are and then what sure. what kind of, how you're practicing medicine in your office today okay so basically we run a business about to how i got there so technically i graduated residency as a dermatologist i never practiced general derm i practiced cosmetic derm i started what i believe was the first cosmetic dermatology clinic at new york medical college and then i was recruited by mount sinai I did one there. This is like in the early 80s before it was really, you know, dermatology cosmetic clinics. And now, you know, there's a ton of them. And I ran a postgraduate course for many years. And then in 1998, I noticed a big switch. Um, I ran the course. I could have 200 people came to my course. In the, in the early times, it was all dermatologists, plastic surgeons, some ear, nose, and throat docs. In 1998, I had 200 attendees. I had five derms, five plastic surgeons, and I had everybody from open heart surgeons to urologists, emergency room medicine, gynecologists, what we now call the non-core guys. And now what I see a bigger switch is all when I talk to people or, or, or healthcare professionals, the nurse practitioners, the nurse, I mean, the physician's assistants and RNs are taking over the business and doing it for Medispas and this Medispa you know, what's it called, uh, ideal image, there's this one, that one, they pop up every single day. And they're really well-funded by the investment bankers. So we're gonna see what happens to that business. But, so the business has really changed on who are the providers who used to be classically the core guys back in the early 80s. And then kind of like the core guys plus the non-core guys. Now we have the core guys, the non-core guys, and we have the, I'll call it the nursing people. I don't know if you know this, that in Nevada, if you're a dental hygienist, you can do filler and Botox. If you're in Oregon, I think that's where you said you are. If you're an esthetician, you can do everything from threads to, to Botox fillers in London. You could take a three month course, be certified as an esthetician, do fillers, do threads, do everything you wanna do, chemical peels. So there's a big, big change away from the doctors, more towards, um, I guess, the healthcare providers. But I got interested in this in 2005 because from when I finished my resident, when I finished my residency in, I think it was 1982, I went to Rome, learned liposuction from Dr. Luz, and I worked with Dr. Fournier, Dr. Fisher, came back and did a lot, a lot of liposuction. So in 2005, I read an article that instead of throwing the fat away, you can take stem cells out of the capillaries and the adipose tissue. I found at that time, the leader in the field, which was a nice doctor in Athens, I went there for two weeks. We did 28 patients. It was interesting. We went to the hospitals. We harvest fat. We drove the fat back in a car to the stem cell lab, and then we processed it, and we drove the stem cells back to the hospital. 
and treated the patient, anything from orthopedics to beauty to autism. It was a really great experience. I'm still friends with the doctor who trained me. And then, as you know, the kind of like in 2005 and two, up to 2010, it was kind of like no one really doing it. It was probably maybe 20 companies, a couple articles. And around 2011, it kind of exploded into the regenerative medicine. You started seeing people doing it. The FDA got involved, and there's the FDA still heavily involved. Doctors got involved, all kinds of specialists. And then it was bone marrow versus adipose tissue, which is a misnomer. And then PRP, as you know, came on the, came on the forefront, which is another regenerative medicine products. And that's grown. And now we see things like exosomes and placenta and Wharton's jelly. And a lot of the information out there, unfortunately, is false or illegal. But it's a, you know, it's a growing field. We'll see. We'll see who, what happens. Um, so we started a regenerative medicine company. We have offices in New York, Dubai. We're opening up in London, uh, Miami, and Mexico City. And we do wellness. So we do stem cells and we do aesthetics. And we have our own technology, but we use other people's technology. And we're, you know, we're, we're basically myself and believe it or not, emergency room doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs. New York was busy until COVID. So now we're rebuilding. New York is opening up again. And the field's going through interesting changes. And we'll see what happens. I mean, the FDA has finally got engaged in this. And unfortunately, I get a lot of emails from companies trying to sell doctors illegal products, but it's, it's, we'll see. It'll be interesting. What do you, when you think of regenerative medicine, what do you think of? Because I actually didn't think about fat. I, I would think of fat transfer in what you were originally saying. I mean, so regenerative medicine is taking the body's tissue and fixing problems from aging to anything to anything. And the problem, one of the technology problems or, you know, terminology problems, I should say more correctly, adipose tissue is a bad terminology because when we take out adipose tissue to quote, make stem cells, we're getting the stem cells or the stromal vascular fraction, it depends on or what, what you want to call them, the MSCs, is coming from the walls of the capillaries, not from the fat. We throw the fat away. So whoever named this a long time ago called adipose derived stem cells, I, I think I've always said that it missed justice. I've tried to correct the media, correct my colleagues, but I just gave up. And instead of saying stromal vascular fraction, I just say adipose stem cells at this point. It, it's just, it's a battle I'm not going to win. So it's all vascular. It's the same as bone marrow. It's the same as in the blood. So it's really not fat. So don't think of fat. But again, you're right. Fat transfer is regenerative medicine. You know, as we age, we lose fat in our face. We gain fat in our bellies. So when taking fat from the belly and putting it in the face is part of regenerative medicine. You're taking your own tissue and you're fixing a problem. In this case, the problem is aging or not looking at it. But you can take that fat, process it correctly, take out the stromal vascular fraction, the MSCs, from the capillaries and inject it into joints and inject it into areas of the body and get re, you know, regeneration of new kind of tissue. So we've grown back heart muscle, we've grown back tendon, tendons, we've grown back cartilage, we've grown back nerves and you know, the field's exploding. But the problem in the field is a lot of people, I have seen patients come to me and told me they got stem cells and they got PRP. The doctor Ooh, said, yeah. well, I did stem cells uh, and they really did PRP. So there's a lot of misinformation. You see this thing now with a hot new thing is exosomes. Yeah. Pull up the FDA and ask their opinion of exosomes. It's not good. They tell you it's illegal. And, but there are people just trying to sell it every single day. And, and I know what an exosome is. I don't know how you really make them and preserve them and try to sell them to somebody. But you know, there's a lot of companies out there trying to do this, telling me it's legal. It's really, call the FDA, it's totally illegal. But again, the information out there is all kinds of information, but the FDA is starting to crack down. So in the near future, we're going to see a lot of changes. We've seen the guys in Florida get in trouble. The guys in California get in trouble. Well, but exosomes from a from the standpoint of, of efficacy seem to have some efficacy because I'm hearing people be excited about it. So what what's working and what do they think they're getting that they're not getting? Or what do you think is going to improve in that field over the next couple of years? Well, I think the exosomes you're seeing today, and again, this is my own personal opinion, so you can all beat me up and kill me. I think it's placebo, placebo effect. I mean, there's studies where you take water and you inject it in people's knees and the pain goes away. So I'm not sure how you manufacture exosomes, preserve them and really sell them and give them to people. 
because exosomes are really vesicles that come off of, quote, the stem cell. So I, I want to see what happens. I mean, we have followed patients since 2005, and we have shown that we've grown back muscle. We've shown we've grown back nerve by studies. We've shown the studies. Exosomes are kind of like a, right now, a marketing fad. So to get a quick result could be placebo. We've seen that. I read a study when hair loss once from one of the big companies, and we tattooed uh, 300 patients. We gave them the active, we gave them water. The first six months, everybody grew hair, everybody. After six months, it was, it was interesting. The placebo patients just dropped right off the chart and the actives you know, did well. So again, there's no clinical studies on exosome today that really follow these patients long-term. I can tell you, we followed our patients now for five years, 10 years, and actually 15 years. We've done the MRIs, we've done the studies, you know, all, these, all the stuff we need to do. And we've shown long-term effectiveness of growing back tissue and improvements. But again, we see a lot, of, a lot of this is marketing, marketing, marketing. So we're gonna wait and see what happens. No one's really done a real solid clinical study long-term. The problem with a lot of these studies, you gotta wait time, see what happens. Yeah. It's not like you inject today and say you're better tomorrow. What happens six months, a year, two years? I've done a lot of baseball players seven years later, you look at their MRIs, their, their, their ACLs, their, 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 their tendons are still good and they're still playing. So that to me is effectiveness. I mean, I, I can grow hair on a placebo basis. I can make pain go away on a placebo basis. So all this marketing is, is again, it's really just out of control right this minute. So for, for lack of a better term, is it adipose tissue that you're re-injecting? Or when you say a baseball player's knee or something, is it PRP? Are we... No, we, spell, we actually technically the real terminology is stromal vascular fraction cell, which is a mixture of mesenchymal cell cells, cells uh, various pieces of the capillary. I could send you this. It has cytokines. It has, it's kind of a mixture. Um, to separate out the mesenchymal stem cells, you need some interesting technology. It's doable, but then the EFT gets all mad at you. Um, it's the same thing with bone marrow. When you take bone marrow stem cells, you're really taking more than just stem cells. It, it's a mixture. So in order to get a pure stem cell, you have to go through a bunch of steps, which are, which are doable, which are really columns, and I can do it if you ask me to do it. But again, once you start manipulating tissue, the FDA gets really, really mad. They're mad, at, they're mad as it is that you're not doing the FDA IND clinical studies, but if you really start growing stuff or manipulating stuff, they really, really get very, very mad. But, but you're, you're harvesting tissue before you're treating, no matter so you what. You harvest tissue. And then yeah. you process the tissue. And again, it depends on, quote, minimal manipulation under the FDA. If you add an enzyme, you violate minim minimal manipulation. If you take the tissue and process it the correct way, and there's lots of different technologies today, that you can literally separate out the cell, cell process, the cells in the walls of the capillary. And basically, you throw the fat away, unless you're doing fat augmentation. That's a whole other story. So what we when I say we injected the athlete's knee, we take out the adipose tissue, we process it in a mechanical fashion. There's numerous mechanical fashions today. We test the cells with a flow cytometer, see how we have live cells. And then we inject the athlete or the person with a cellular product and the fat's gone. The fat is just a lipid. We throw that in the garbage. We don't need that. Nobody wants that, at mm -hmm. least in that case. So that's, that's what we do. In, in surgical cases where they are putting fat back in. I know there are some, some physicians are mixing some amount of PRP and, and contend that improves the vascularization of the, the tissue. Others say that if you put too much PRP in, you'll overvascularize the tissue, it will all die. What, any thoughts there? Sure. Again, there's no clinical studies. Unfortunately, it's all, it's all kind of like I call them myths or fairy tales. So if you take fat and you, and you treat it correctly and you transplant it, it's going to be fine. It's it's not going to die. If you if you don't do it correctly, it's going to die. If you take fat and add a stromal vascular fraction, it'll last a much longer vascularization. If you put the right amount of PRP, and we don't know what that really is today, you can increase the angiogenesis, which increases the tissue longevity. So again, the problem is in physicians, the technique varies from doctor to doctor to doctor. There is no real standardization or protocols that I can tell you because nobody has one today. How much PRP, how'd you make your PRP? And, and what I love the best is someone says, my PRP is better than your PRP. 
Yeah. So my question to everybody is, if we all know basic science, we take out blood, and PRP is just separating the red blood cells from the plasma. How are you going to make more, more, more platelets than existed from day one? I just wonder how you do it. I mean, you can kill them if, you, if you're too aggressive. You can't make something that wasn't there. So, you know, everybody's that, protocol is different. To your marketing point, I mean, that's one that I really have seen is the concentration of placelets and blah, blah, blah. As I understand it, the contention is some systems t t have to take more blood and then they, they spin it down and they because they have more quantity to begin with, they're, they're saying that they're able to spin down something more rich that way. But sample to sample, right? It's all the same blood coming from the same patient. Exactly. It, it looks, I could take out three cc's, I could take out 60 cc's. If I take out 60 cc's, I'm gonna make four, more PRP. If I take out three, I'm gonna make less. But I can't, I can't take out three cc's of blood and make, and make more platelet than I existed beginning with. And you know, it depends on how much you want to inject because we know, we know from the orthopedic guides, if you inject too much fluid in the tissue, you get a negative effect instead of a positive effect. Yeah. We also know from the orthopedic guys, they'll show you, they, there's a studies where they inject water and the patient has no more pain, at least, at least for like six weeks. And all of a sudden the pain comes back. So again, you gotta be careful about placebo effects. I believe PRP works. I believe if it's injected correctly and carefully, it works. But I, I do resent the doctors who tell the patients, I just gave you stem cells. There are no, mm. really, there's no stem cells in PRP. I mean, if you're lucky, there's one. Right, right. And I don't, I'm not even sure what the advantage is other than the catchphrase stem cells. Well, you can charge $5,000 instead of $1,000. I gave you stem cells for $5,000. You know, mm. this, we, we have patients come here and said, oh my God, I got stem cells. And it really didn't work. And it cost me $5,000, $10,000. And we say, what'd they do? Well, they drew some blood and they went in another room and they came back and inject this kind of yellowish liquid in me. And, you know, obviously it's PRP. And yeah. we know the doctors and we know it's PRP, but they're telling the patients it's stem cells because they can charge $5,000, $10,000. So you're, I, I'm, you're, it sounds like, and I'm assuming you, you are a fan of PRP, just having... I think it's added a lot to what we're doing in regenerative medicine in general. I see it getting used adjunctively with a lot of applications now. So that seems to have some promise. Is there a, a system for getting the PRP that you, you like better than others or? No, we tried them all. We tested them all. We have flow cytometers. So we were able to test all these situations. I mean, honestly, some are expensive, some are less expensive. It doesn't matter what you, again, you can't make something that doesn't exist. And if you're careful, you're not gonna, you're not gonna kill the platelets and kill the cytokines. So you have to be crazy to kill it. So I mean, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, I, a doctor say, what should I get? What should I get? Whatever you're comfortable with, if your staff is comfortable, at the end of the day, you're gonna get a PRP product. And then if you wanna add some calcium to make it more fibrous or whatever you wanna do with it, and again, don't inject too much because you inject too much fluid in a joint, particularly you're going to trouble. But for hair growth and wrinkles and anti-inflammatory, it's great. I mean, my patients call it the, uh, the poor man stem cells. Yeah. Are you, are there some, you know, this is the business of aesthetics. So people are interested. Are there some brands that you've been happy with in terms of systems? So since we run a stem cell lab and have all the technology, we, we make our own. We don't buy anybody's systems in all honesty. You can actually, if you're smart enough and Google enough, you can actually figure out how to make it without buying these expensive uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Some of them today have gone down to like a hundred dollars, but honestly, what you're buying, if you look at it carefully, cost about, I don't know, two, three bucks. So if you're clever enough, you don't need me. It's easy to Google this. Just remember what PRP is. It's basically taking out the red blood cells. Yeah, yeah, so if, you go, if you go into the world of hospitals, you get what, what do you get for patients? You get fresh frozen plasma. Is fresh frozen plasma PRP? And the answer is pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I had a physician, this is some years ago, but just equate the hodgepodge, you know, making PRP yourself. And I think it's different in a facility like yours that's had decades of experience, but you know, with, if you have an MA and an esthetician and a staff of a couple, of, but they made the, the kind of comparison that it was like home brewing. You know, you may not always get the same consistency. You 
may not get the, the the product each time and that you're you're better off just to you know buy from somebody well unfortunately that's that's not really true because take you look at the scientific what's blood it's red blood cells platelets white blood cells and liquid so basically all you're all you're doing to make prp is you're getting rid of the red blood cells nothing more Nothing less. It's pretty simple. Uh, there's no magic to it, honestly. I know everybody wants to make magic to it. And, you know, it's what it is. There is a science. You look at the science. It's pretty basic. But if yeah, you I mean, like the system, what, you use what it. About the white, what about the white blood cell, though? I know in some, there's some argument that you need it. There's some argument that, that, it, that it actually hurts, especially in orth orthopedics, that it's not helpful. Well, there, you know, the red blood cells and the white blood cells are things you don't really want. But if you look at the size of, the, of those cells, they pretty much separate. So if you, okay, just let's go to the blood world. To make fresh frozen plasma, you know what they do? They basically spin it a couple of times, get rid of the red blood cells, get rid of the white cells because they're different sizes. And they basically make fresh frozen plasma. Fresh frozen plasma is just a lot of PRP in a bag, in all honesty. So you don't have to be a magician. You don't need me to tell you how to do it. You could just look this stuff up and learn how to do it. Just look awesome. at the technology to separate out the platelets or the, or the plasma is what you want to do. And how about in terms of um, uh, opinions on uh, injection, not necessarily technique because obviously location matters, but quantity or is there... I mean, I know uh, you want to be really superficial. I know things like PRP, you get into the sub Q and, and everyone, you know, it's, it's, it dissolves or it's gone. So you want to be, so is that bevel up injection and <laughs> that kind of stuff? Do you, are you doing retrograde versus, you know, does it yeah. doesn't matter? We hear that all the time. At the end of the day, if you're injecting scalp or face, you want it in the dermis or right on the dermis. If you're doing joints, you want it where the problem is. So ultrasound does help you get the needle in the right place. If you want to, you can add some calcium gluconate. It makes it like a jelly and it makes it stay more in the place. But at, at the end of the day, if you're a decent injector, you should have no problems doing it. Just remember, you don't want to pump in too much fluid so it's all swollen because you can look at the orthopedic literature, whether it's cortisone, whatever you're doing, too much is detrimental to the joint tissue. On the face and the scalp, it's really putting it in the right place. What I see is we train a bunch of people. They have a tendency to inject it into the deep subcutaneous fat. And it's like you might as well not bother doing it. Because remember, these are supposed to be intradermal injections for the hair follicles and, again, for the skin. Just think about where the hair follicles are. Just think about where the dermis is. So if you put the needle too deep, you're going to inject, inject too deep and you're going to lose the effectiveness. So it's really just an injection technique. And I tell people if they want to learn it, remember the days when they were in medical school or in turn, they were making PPTs, you know, PPDs for tuberculosis, raise a bleb. Yeah. And you know, you're 99% correct. Yeah. I mean, so that idea. Bevel up, right? bevel down, doesn't matter. It depends on who was injecting. Right. But bevel up may make that slight difference for somebody, especially if you're in a tear trough or somewhere, you know, somewhere really thin. Well, again, it's a matter of technique. You just got to be good at getting it into the dermis or right under the dermis. It just takes a little time and a little training. And I'll tell you, it's honestly, I've trained hundreds and hundreds of doctors. Some doctors get it and some never do. As I tell people, listen, the person is your canvas or your piece of clay. I can give anybody a, a bunch of paintbrushes and paint. Not everybody's good at it. It's just the way it goes. I mean, I've trained 1,500 plus doctors in liposuction. I've actually told some doctors, do me a favor, I'll give your money back for the course. Don't bother. You're just not good at it. Just, you know, it's just what it is. I mean, it, so there's technique and there takes time to learn. It takes training and it takes practice like anything else. Any tennis player, if you look at the Nadal, he practices, 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 practices. It takes practice, practice, be really good. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from your mistakes. So the guy who takes the course for two hours or does the YouTube or takes the eight hour course is not going to be the guy who's been injecting for five years. But there again, there are Rembrandts and Picassos out there and there are guys that should, you know, hang up their paintbrushes or, or ladies. So it's, it, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of artistic skill beyond scientific skill. Mm -hmm. 
How about transdermal deliveries? So like now we have a laser assisted delivery. We have, I know they're working on micron level or, you know, these nanoparticles and you gotta, are you, is that coming through in regenerative medicine for, for wrinkles and other kinds of lotions? And, you know, honestly, a needle, we use 32 gauge needles mostly. It's pretty small. Um, you can do it by dermajet. You can do it by micro needles. You can do it any way you want to do it. Again, if you get it in the dermis, you're doing a good job. If you get it right in the dermis, you're doing a good job. It's technique. Again, I tell everybody, I say, remember the days you, you, you put in PPDs. Mm-hmm. You put in tuberculosis tests. You basically raised a blood. I know people don't like to raise a blab because the patients don't love it because they, you know, they don't look great afterwards, but they get great results. If you put it too deep, it doesn't work unless you're looking for, you know, less, unless you're trying to increase volume, then you want to go deep. But if you're looking for hair, you're looking for skin changes, you really want to be intradermal. Remember, we talk about intradermal, intradermal in the dermis, not in the subcutaneous fat. If you want to put it under the dermis, okay. But if you put it in the dermis, better. If you put it deep in the subcutaneous fat, you're not going to get great results. I tell people this. And again, it's without the easiest thing to tell everybody. Is, remember when you were younger, you did PPDs. Just do a lot of PPDs. It's really simple. Simple. I can't remember the acronym, uh, the, uh, 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 acronym you used instead of the 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 you know, tissue, the adipose tissue. You want we to say call that? it thromal vascular fraction cells, SVFC. It's a heterogeneous population of mesenchymal stem cells, a little bit of cytokines, a little bit of periocytes, a little bit of epidermal cells from the blood vessels. It's, you can look it up. And then if you want to separate out the MSCs, it's doable, but it's, it's, it's not cheap. And, and the FDA does not like you. But mostly what you're doing from an injection standpoint is that it's not PRP, correct? I just want to make clear. So we do, so pre-COVID when New York was busy, we would do anywhere from 50 to 75 PRP injections a week. Combination of hair loss, you know, wrinkles and some, some orthopedics. We had multiple doctors. And then we do, then we do other things. We do nanofat, we do fat trans, transplant. We do, we do, we do SVF injections into, again, hair, face, and joints. It's all injected in the same place. Honestly, it's a matter of money because as you go up the chain, what we talk about, the procedures get more expensive because there's more lab work, there's more sterility issues. And to make PRP is really, really inexpensive. Even if you buy one of the kits. To make real SVFCs for for the rejections we're talking about, it gets much more expensive because you have the equipment's more expensive, the sterility issues are more expensive, the technology is more expensive. It's just more expensive to the patient. It can run anywhere from $1,000 to $25,000. As I said, a lot of my patients call PRP the poor man stem cells. But, it's, but remember, I tell people there's no stem cells in PRP. It's important to understand that. Yeah, but there's certainly a lot of growth factor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why it works. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. So we did, think, studies, we did studies t- testing growth factor in PRP versus growth factors in a, in a stromal vascular fraction component. It's a thousand times more growth factors in, this, in the harvesting of the adipose tissue and processing than PRP, but growth factors work. Clearly, that's why PRP works. It's the anti-inflammatory effect, the angiogenesis effect. It's all the regenerative medicine effects we like to see. Are you, how, any of the uh, either human or... Uh, animal plant-based growth factors in topicals where are you seeing those those work or is there promise there it's all it's all marketing dollars you know i know there's the snail there's the you know the the, the uh, there's some human with with either fetus or um uh, uh well, i want to i want to I want to challenge anybody out there to get a human stem cell, whether it's placenta, whatever it is, and put it in a lotion potion and sell it to a person that buys it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days later that something is really in there alive. Not going to happen. Well, I mean, that skin, uh, skin Medica, right? That's, that's their big product. Well, it, okay. 
it's, it's not really not, you can't take a human stem cell or an animal stem cell and put it in a cream and lotion and keep it alive. We tried doing it and we tried and tried and tried and tried and there's no way to do it. And anyway, it's, it doesn't really work. Plant, I don't know if plant stem cells penetrate. I don't, we, I'm not a big believer in it, in all honesty. Here's what I believe in. Take a needle and inject it. Mm-hmm. And it works. Mm-hmm. Is that a, uh, is there anything else that you're injecting besides these, these, these couple, the PRP and uh, your, the acronym, I'm not going to get in this podcast, okay. but I'll put up everyone. Okay. So again, we inject a lot, a lot of PRP. We inject a lot, a lot of, you know, we'll call it nanofat. We inject a lot of stromal vascular fraction components that we do mechanically and those are the big regenerative medicine products today. And again, if you look at regenerative medicine products, you basically want to, you want angiogenesis, you want anti-inflammatory, you want to grow new tissue. And there's a whole, there's a whole things you want to do. You want antitrophic effects. That's regenerative medicine. So those are the real products today that are available for everybody and anybody. It's just that, unfortunately, there's a lot of companies out there marketing and marketing and marketing, and there's no scientific basis to what they sell and how they sell it. And the FDA eventually gets to them when they get on, on the radar. The problem with a lot of these companies, they're under the radar. So the FDA doesn't bother with them until they get on the radar. Then the FDA comes and knocks on their door and says, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, there. I mean, I think also, in especially with PRP, because the FDA was so slow, the, the educational apparatus around the product was also incredibly slow. So here we have this product that everyone kind of thought worked, but no one knew how to inject it. Nobody was allowed to teach you how to inject it or tell you what to do. So I, I, I think the learning curve has been very long on some of those products. It's probably taken a lot of failures to get the successes that we've had. Yeah, that's what happens. You know, the good guys win and the bad guys lose, but it takes time. And yeah. unfortunately, today's world of Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all these things, you know, it's easy to get some misinformation out there. And in Photoshop, I see pictures. I'll tell you, I see pictures. I've been doing this a long time and I've done a lot of patients. And some of the technology and some of the injectables I see are like, I wish I could do that. I really wish I could. I could do it in Photoshop. And I know they're Photoshopping because there's no way, no matter who you are, you can do some of these before and after pictures. It's, they're impossible. Yeah. I kind of laugh. But you know what? People believe. People don't know. I had one lady who was going to a doctor and she was very sophisticated. I said, why are you going to him? Oh, he's got the best Instagram before and after pictures I've ever seen. I said, you ever Google him? She said, why would I Google him? I said, because he has 21 lawsuits about injectables and problems and things. I said, maybe, maybe you should Google him. Yeah. But yeah. people don't Google anymore. Today's world is honestly, it's Instagram is like the king. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, are you, uh, I want to, if, if people want to get in touch with you after this podcast, um, both, you're, you're still doing, actively doing research, correct? Correct. We're actually doing cool. research. We're actually treating patients. We're actually building it. Well, so we, we lost our office during COVID or at least ran out, believe it or not, how crazy that was. So we're building a brand new one because we got an, a special opportunity to take care of a very high level uh, building in New York City with 4,000 tenants. So we're building a new facility again because our lease, I, it was kind of funny. We were at our old office 10 years and I got a notice from the landlord. Do you want to renew your lease? And I was like, why? He said, you're there 10 years. 10 years goes so quick. Oh my God. When you sign that 10 year, you think this is the rest of my life and you That's blink true. and it's, and, and you need a new lease. Yeah. And then, and then seriously, we, it just happened. And the lease literally expired during COVID and the landlord didn't understand COVID. We're trying to explain that we were shut down, had zero revenues, paying all our staff, paying our rent, paying you know, all our bills, and he didn't get it. So we, unfortunately, the lease, the lease expired during COVID. Now, the new place, we started a 15-year lease. And watch, 15 years would go like a snap of a finger. We all would look at each other like all of us. We were like 28 of us. We're like 15. This, we've been here 10 years? That's crazy. <laughs> That's it. That's funny. Yeah. So if, uh, if companies want to hire, oh, they want to do studies or come, or they're looking to come into the United States or looking for consulting or patients. So I'm at, if it's the same way, but, or patients want to get a hold of you, what are the best ways for patients to do that? And then we'll, 
repost that uh, uh, on this podcast to make it available for everyone. So the funny thing is, funny answer. So I get contacted on email, cell phone, text messages, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So any of the things work today, my existing patients will sometimes actually text me on Instagram. And then one time they'll text me, they'll call the office and then they'll do Facebook. It's the craziest world today. Yeah. People contact me. I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready for a pigeon to, flow, to fly in my window with something attached to its leg. <laughs> Seriously, I get, I get requests and, and questions by every technology means there is. So and it, look, it's smart to have all those avenues open, you know, as a physician, it's smart to, and it just shows that having those avenues open work, but will you share, uh, do you know your Instagram handle and your, your phone number and that kind of stuff? I know my phone number. I don't know my Instagram handle. So, so my cell number, which everybody has anyways, 917-459-8252. So you can text me, you can WhatsApp me, you can call me. Everybody has my number. I'm, I'm open to talk to everybody, anybody. There's no big secrets or people are invited. Once we build a new office, that'll take a, we have like three months left and we'll reopen again. So we have, we have lots of, we've had we, pre COVID. We had a lot of visitors. We, we had a lot of you know, interns. We're into education and training. Yeah. I know you do a lot with uh, uh, professional organizations, American Academy of Dermatology, American Society of Laser Medicine, some of the others. Do you, uh, how about an email? Oh, so it's S, like Sam Victor, my name, at regenmedicalpc.com. That's the best one. Okay, terrific. Yeah. We'll make those available. We'll also, uh, I'll grab your Instagram and we'll post that up there as well. So if you're a company looking to reach out to um, Dr. Stephen Victor, or if you're a um, patient looking and then you're in the New York area or traveling to that area and you're looking to get signed up, even though you may get on a list for a few more months and you'll be in a brand new shiny space. But um, Dr. Victor, thank you so much. I, 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 it was a candid conversation. I really appreciate your perspective. I think having a, a specialist in um, regenerative medicine uh, helped me understand its role in anti-aging a little bit better and the things that are out there and brought clarity. So. Uh, appreciate your your time and and uh, have a terrific evening thank you thanks for joining us this week on the business of aesthetic podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors amp laser optech and equa marketing and silver sponsors eileen works and pronox would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the business of aesthetics podcast or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetics business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head on over to www.businessofaesthetics.org forward slash speakers and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.